Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. This coming Sunday, we will be celebrating True Vine Sunday, where the gospel reading will be the beautiful parable of the True Vine. The parable of the Good Shepherd and the parable of the True Vine are the two parables in which we call Christological parables. They're parables that help us explore the question, who is Jesus? Who is Christ? Montessori would refer to these two parables as our great lessons, and Rebecca Reutsevich refers to them as the linchpins. And what these things mean is that from these two parables, everything that we do in our atria, we are able to build off of from these two essential parables. And the children have revealed their essentiality to us and their importance in the place in the atrium over these last 60 plus years in the atrium. So we have invited Tim Bell, who is a catechist, but also who works with vines for his profession, to come and speak with us today to help us kind of dive into this parable with new eyes from that of a vine grower. I hope that this episode helps you to dive into this parable in a new way and prepares your heart to celebrate this Sunday, True Vine Sunday. I hope you enjoy. Tim, welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. We are very excited to have you on. Thank you, Carrie. I'm really happy to be here. Tim, would you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got involved in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Sure. So, you know, for for me, the the journey really started with our, our children. So when our son was three and we had moved to St. Helena area in California, Northern mm-hmm. California, the, the parish we were at was using catechesis for um, the children's program. And so not knowing anything about it, we um, had him uh, participate. And Mm -hmm. I was really fortunate that my my wife, Jennifer, was very observant and and curious about things that he manifested at home. Actually, we were just talking about this last night, how he um, at dinner wanted to perform the epiclesis gesture (laughs) over a plate (laughs) and, and other things like that. And, and she was like, well, what is this? What is going on? <laughs> and, um, so that was kind of our entry into a life calling as a family. So, and, and when I say as a family, I am, I've been trained as a catechist in all levels and my wife as well. And she's also a formation leader, but also our daughter, our younger daughter, um, Emma is a level one catechist, um, has, has been trained as a level one catechist and has served as that, you know, for me. I've really loved, well, so I, I started my first formation in 2005 mm-hmm. and I've, I've just loved how all the levels, but I, I've spent most of my time as, as a catechist in level three and um, loved how that level has opened up the Old Testament to me and, and kindled a love for our, our Jewish roots. And um, you know, I've just met so many wonderful people and mm-hmm. um, along the way, I feel like I've just sort of traveled in the wake of some amazing people like... Um, Rebecca Roy Savage and Elizabeth Calancini, and, mm-hmm. and I'd, I'd call my wife one of those two. <laughs> um, and she's a very gifted catechist and, and formation leader. But, you know, kind of a few highlights along the way was getting when I traveled to uh, Birmingham area for my level three um, with Anna Hurdle and just met some really wonderful people there. I was lucky to be in, invited along with Jennifer and Emma to travel to Wales to participate in the, the seminal infant toddler, toddler formation there. Wow. Yeah. And then kind of the most, the most recent adventure that, that the catechesis brought was in 2019, Jennifer and I traveled to Rome. Uh, Jennifer was invited to participate in a formation with the sisters of the mission missionaries of charity, mother Teresa sisters. Yeah. And, and I joined her for a little bit of that and um, helped do some presentations and, uh, just what amazing experience it was being with the sisters and seeing their amazing tenderness and earnestness and their love for mm-hmm. the Good Shepherd. That's awesome. There are a few things of your story that really stuck out. I love the way that you just said that it was a family journey that y'all entered into. That's really profound and beautiful. I, I think that a lot of people can relate to the fact that we go into this ministry thinking that we are going to be serving the children. And it turns into much bigger than that. Um, It turns into a 
conversion of our own hearts, but yes. conversion of our whole family and how we participate in the life of our family and the life of our children. And yeah, it, it can really become a journey for the whole family. And that's really beautiful that even your children as adults are now so involved in this work with you guys. Yeah. It's, things have um, in the last year or so have sort of put a lot of things on pause. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're looking to see what, what comes next, but you just reminded me that I always tell people that the catechesis is the best adult religious formation that yes. I've ever experienced. And I, I pr truly believe that. I do too. I always tell people, especially when I'm trying to really convert them to come to formation, maybe convert's not the right word, but to convince them yeah. to come to formation with us that you won't regret it. Even if you don't become a catechist, you will not regret participating in the formation. Yes. And I think it's really awesome that you as a man are a catechist because we have so much fewer men catechists. It is a need for the boys that are in our program to see grown men growing in their faith, especially with this program, because you are not sitting there teaching them, you are sitting beside them growing with them. And what a testimony that is of just life and action to have a grown man sitting next to them, exploring this Bible study or exploring these prayers of the mass, especially those nine to 12 year old children. I think that that is a really beautiful witness that you're providing for them. And I just want to thank you for that. Well, thank you. I, I agree. I, I would love to see more and more men get involved in this work because right. it would enrich their lives so much. Yes. Amen. Amen. I totally agree. So this Sunday, the Sunday after this podcast episode airs, we will be celebrating True Vine Sunday. Our gospel reading will be the parable of the true vine. And this is a very important parable in our work with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, especially for that second plain child, that level two, level three, six to 12 year old child. Rebecca in her book, Life in the Vine, she calls it the linchpin parable for that age group. Mm. They have this cosmic parable that has threads that go all across the world, but then also connections between us and heaven, this beautiful cosmic parable. And I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, Tim, because of your unique work that you do personally as somebody who works with vines. And so I'm excited to kind of get your perspective of this parable from this angle of actually working with vines as your career. But before we dive into that, I think it would be really beautiful if we started with reading the parable. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. So I'm going to be reading John chapter 15, verse 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does he prunes, so that it bears more fruit. You are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, because without me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither. People will gather them and throw them into a fire, and they will be burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Mm -hmm. 
Tim, I'd like to start off by asking you what we always ask the children, but I'm curious with your personal perspective of what do you hear? What stands out to you when you hear that parable? Well, for me today, when I, I hear you read that, the, the remain, we, you know, we, we can hear that that's repeated several times, but just that invitation, you know, as, as someone coming into hearing this, who already knows the good shepherd and his love for me, that feels so powerful, that, that invitation mm-hmm. to remain. And it sounds very intimate to me. I and you and you and me. Mm-hmm. The word remain for me, it emphasizes the choice that God gives us. Mm-hmm. And for me, that is very profound because it just, I guess it makes me feel very loved that he has given me a choice to remain with him or not, or to follow him or not. It, that intimate love that he has for me, that he desires for me to just remain. There's nothing, especially I guess as a mom <laughs> and being very busy, he just wants me to sit. He just wants me to do nothing with him. He just wants me to remain. There's nothing more than remain that he's asking of me. And it's comforting. That word is very comforting to me. Yeah. As a vine grower, does this parable speak to you or stand out to you in a different way? Or the words that Jesus chose to use speak to you in a different way since you see vines and you work with vines on a regular basis? Well, you know, what's what's interesting <laughs> is that although I've, I've read this parable many times, I didn't really think of it that profoundly in in the perspective of my work until a number of years ago, there was a formation of, of catechists in our area. And someone had asked me, I think it might have been Elizabeth Calancini, but just to come meet that group out in the vineyard in front mm. of the vines and read this parable and talk about it from my perspective. And you know, and in preparing for that, then I really started to see a lot more in it. I, I'd like to uh, walk through kind of the, the step of operations throughout the year that we do in the vineyard. Yeah. And for me, I really see, I, I see a lot in that. And and I am a, a winemaker. Professionally, I've been involved in winemaking for uh, almost 29 years now. And it is my work to work with um, growers in our own vineyards for the for the winery I work for, as well as independent growers and producing the best fruit possible. Please educate us. How does the process work so that this parable can be more profound for us? Well, um, I, I just want to say, too, that I think there's a, a really, for me, a, a special connection between my vocation and my spirituality because of the place that wine holds and in, in the Jewish tradition and our Christian tradition and mm-hmm. Um, how God gave us grapes and yeast to create something joyful that we can have at our table. Yeah. So say that, you know, the parable, you know, obviously talks about pruning explicitly, but there are other steps taken throughout the year to care for the vine that help it produce the best possible fruit. And, you know, I'm thinking of this as perspective of of wine grapes to make the best possible wine grapes. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I think about them, they all in a, in a way are, taking away things that get in the way of making the best fruit. And so really the, for me, I I would start in the winter when the vines are dormant and you've got last year's shoots, which have hardened off and turned into what we call canes. So they're woody. It's kind of almost like a a vine skeleton (laughs) sitting there. And then we have workers go through and cut down those, those shoots and leave just the right number of buds. So there's the grapevine in the current growing season, new buds are forming that will form the shoots of next year's crop. And so mm-hmm. you really kind of start the process a year ahead. The pruning, it's very important to leave the right number of buds to, to have the right number of shoots for the vine. And we always talk about balance. And so what we are trying to achieve is not too many shoots um, and not too few. If you leave too many buds and have the vine try to grow too many shoots, then the shoots will be weak and it's trying to support more than it, than it has the capacity to, to handle. And the same regard, if you go the other direction, if you leave too few buds, then there's the shoots will be very vigorous and they'll have excessive energy. And, and one of the things that's important in growing wine grapes is that the shoots reach, you know, the right length. We want probably about three feet or so in length, maybe a little longer, but then we want the shoots to stop growing 
on their own, if possible. And that's so that the, the vine stops putting its energy into just growing more leaves and, and growing a longer shoot, but starts putting its energy into ripening the fruit. And so if you have these too few buds left on the vine and you have this excess vigor in the shoots, it leads to prolonged shoot growth and ultimately some underripe fruit. And, and also just having too many leaves, um, too, too much of a leafy vine shades out those little buds that are being formed for next year and getting the light on those buds is very important to their fruitfulness. So it, it not only affects the crop right now, but what's to come um, after that. And so when the pruners come through, you, you cut the last year's shoots or canes to the right number of buds. There's also some, depending on how you're pruning it, some tying of the those um, canes down to the, the wires of the trellis, putting those those shoots in the right position is very important so that you're getting the, the new shoots that'll come in the spring growing in the right direction. So, it, you know, all the mm -hmm. choices of cuts and positioning is, is very important and setting up the vine to grow better. And not only that, but the timing of pruning is important. It does two things. One thing is if you do it too early, then the vine wants to start growing too early and may be more susceptible to frost because it's early in the year. If you delay too long, the same thing, that the, the shoots are behind in growth and, and your, the fruit may not mature in time before the weather starts turning cold or rainy. Mm -hmm. And also if you do you know, pruning in the rain, sometimes that can lead to um, spores, fungal spores that are, lead to disease in the vine getting into those pruning cuts. And so just a lot of considerations just about when you do that work. So then in, in the spring, we have new shoots growing. And, and as we're recording this, this we've, you know, around me and our vineyards, there's um, the new shoots are bursting out. And a lot of them are about, I don't know, maybe four or five inches long, maybe a little longer. And so you, you find out not only do those the shoots from those buds that you left on purpose grow, but there's actually these what we call latent buds that are actually little buds that never pushed out new shoots all over the vine. So as the vine gets older and older, it's got all these other shoots. And it's kind of almost like a backup plan for the vine. If, if something goes wrong with some of the other shoots, others can grow. Mm -hmm. But again, you don't want the vine to be trying to grow too many shoots and not in the right position as well. You want the right spacing. You don't want them crowded together too much. because You want to be able to get some good airflow through the vine to naturally cut down on uh, mildew and fungal diseases that might attack it. So one of the first steps um, that we're, we'll be doing very soon in the vineyard at this time of year is, is removing those, those shoots that grow from the latent buds. They, they grow on the trunk of the vine and all sorts of places. And you just go through and, and remove those and, again, help the vine have just the right number of shoots. The, the other thing that would be happening in the spring is each shoot, I always thought this is interesting, but each little bud, I should say, has three potential shoots within it. If, if you mm. were to dissect those buds and, and put it under a microscope, you see that all the little structures of, of leaves and clusters are already there. In, in it's, it's called the cluster primordia. It's all there, mm. but just in a very tiny form. And there's three of those. And again, it's, it's like I said, with those other buds, it's like a backup plan for the vine so that if you know, one shoot pushes and frost were to make it die off, then it's got two more that can take over and start growing. But sometimes the vine, something goes wrong and two or three of those shoots all grow from one bud. So again, we don't want more than one shoot from each bud growing. So you have to look for that and remove those extra shoots. They've started to push as well. And you have to carefully choose which ones to remove. You'd want to probably leave the one that's the, the strongest and healthiest, but also the position they're growing in and pointing in may influence what you decide to, to leave and, and what you decide to remove. Then later in the spring, the grapevines will flower and the fruit is set. You know, each little grape is actually a, a tiny flower. Um, doesn't really look exactly like a flower. Um, and, the, and the petals actually form a little cap that pops off so that the fruit is set and starts growing and you can see what, what you've got. Workers will come through and remove some of the leaves right in that zone where the fruit is on the vine. Cause it's usually it's, it's lower on the shoot, not high up. It's, it's very near kind of the more permanent structures of the vine. So you want to remove some of those leaves to get 
some light into that zone where the fruit is. Mm -hmm. And again, balance is very important. We don't want too little light. If you have not enough light on the fruit, the color is not as good and the flavors may be more green and underdeveloped. But if you expose the fruit too much, then there can be problems like if you have really heat spell um, that happens, you can damage the fruit as well. So early on, if you have a heat spell, some of those berries that are most exposed and, and receive most of the, the heat will actually stop forming. They'll kind of shrivel up a little bit and they look like raisins, but they don't have sugar. They're very acidic. They just basically mm -hmm. died and stopped ripening. Later, once the mm -hmm. fruit is colored up and starting to soften, if you have too much heat, then those some of those exposed berries can just turn into raisins and just shrivel up and... We really don't want that either. We want the right flavors and the right amount of sugar in the grapes to make the best possible wine. Mm. And then another step that is taken after that is removing excess clusters. So kind of our ideal vine is that each new shoot has two clusters. There's some exceptions. I mean, if like sometimes we may even only want one if it's an exceptionally big clusters on that, that shoot. But essentially, sometimes the vine may try to set three clusters on, on a shoot. And so you go through and remove those clusters. And again, looking carefully, typically we would take the one at the top because that tends to ripen latest. But position of the clusters in relationship to each other may affect that. So it's, it's a, another careful choice. And, um, but if, if you remove too few of clusters as well, that can create a situation where the clusters ripen too quickly. And maybe all the different ripening processes aren't really in sync. So you may get um, sugar developing, but maybe the flavors aren't quite there where you want them to be at the right time. So again, mm -hmm. trying to get all those, those different elements, the color, flavor, sugar mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the grapes in balance. And then later, um, probably somewhere in, in early summer, we take a second pass of fruit thinning. And at that point, we're looking for any clusters that are lagging behind in ripeness. Maybe they, they haven't colored up fully or they're a little bit green even. So we, we will cut those off, you know, some nice even ripening in all the fruit. And then the other things we may be doing is removing a portion of the clusters. I, I wish we were out in the vineyard and I could show you all these things. But mm -hmm. on, on a grape cluster, there's there's often a little bit of a, you know, there's the main cluster. And at the top, there's a little bit of a sort of a side cluster that people call a shoulder or sometimes they call it a wing. Mm-hmm. And so we may, if it's a big clustered grape variety, we may just choose to go through and cut off some of those shoulders. Again, the goal of achieving even ripeness throughout the cluster itself. Or you may see that some clusters, because of how the vine has grown, are sort of tangled together, or maybe even one sort of laying on top of the other, and it's preventing the right amount of sunlight getting into to the fruit. And so you may have to either sort of detangle those if it's if it's uh, early enough that you're not doing damage or just even remove one of the clusters even if you've got the right number per shoot but if they're you know one's laying on top of another and that one underneath is not going to receive enough sunlight then you may choose to remove that one that's underneath so that you have best possible development in the fruit mm -hmm. and, and then may at this time be seeing some evidence of some disease or stunted growth basically in some of the vines and you may choose to mark those vines with a little piece of colored flagging tape so that later, you know, after harvest that you, you come back and, and do something about that. I think about in the true vine parable, when Jesus talks about taking away the branch that does not bear fruit. And, and that brings for me to mind particular disease of grapevines called eutypa. And it's, it's a disease that starts at the vine's extremities and works its way down into the plant mm -hmm. and ultimately can get into the trunk of the vine and, and can slowly destroy the vine. But if you catch this in time, before it travels too far into the plant, the vine can be saved. And what you do is you cut back the vine itself. You know, so you're actually cutting some of the more permanent woody structure of the vine, cutting it below where the disease has progressed. Mm -hmm. And then you can uh, rely on one of those latent buds that I talked about to push in the, the next spring, and you can use that to reform the vine. So sometimes you'll see them in, in, in a, you know, a real more extreme case, they choose one of those, those latent buds from down low on the trunk of the vine and start growing up a new shoot before the disease has progressed too far. 
and and basically you're training a brand new vine and then and then after yeah. you've, you've trained that shoot up then you're, you cut off a lot of the wood you end up with a, a healthy vine that can continue and so that's kind of all the different things that i think of going into the the care of, of vines i know that a friend of ours when she saw me or heard me talking about this in the vineyard she's also a catechist and she just my wife asked her what her reaction was to this and she said you know, if a vine receives that much care, you know, that's a lot of care that goes into to producing that fruit. How much more care must I get? Yeah. I, I have to say, I hadn't thought of that, but that's, I think that's, yeah. that's really true. That is, yeah, that as you've been going through this very intricate, detailed way of how you have to care for just one vine and the, ba the constant balance that you are finding through each of these steps, I, that's exactly what I was thinking. I guess I've never imagined God, the vine grower, so active. And I, I think that sounds a little silly now that I'm saying it out loud, but um, I guess I've just never imagined it that way. But yeah, oh my gosh, like that is a lot of work to get one vine to grow this beautiful, perfect fruit. And um, I can only imagine how much more God, the vine grower, is doing in me. I was imagining me as one vine and it, God, the vine grower was, has been doing all these different balancing inside of me in order to kind of mold me in that right direction. Like you were saying with the vine to help me to get in the right direction, to grow closer to him and to, to help to bear that beautiful fruit that he is, that would glorify him. Yeah. But yeah so intricate and so much work involved in that. Well, when you, um, we first started talking today, you were talking about as a mother and how remaining means for you just to sometimes be still and just mm -hmm. calm down, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. and I really see that in, and when I think about all these, these different steps that we take to produce good fruit in the vine, that it's all about balance that, so if I take on too much and neglect the things I need to do to take care of myself. I don't produce the best fruit. Yes. I get depleted. And if I, if I'm only doing, and instead of sometimes just being with Jesus, or not doing my practices like, like journaling or daily prayer life or, you know, reading the lectionary for me, all these things that keeps the sap, the, the spirit flowing, you know, in me, then I really can see it. I, I'm more irritable. I'm not as effective in my life mm -hmm. around me. Don't like to be around me as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, you know, for me, balance, the, this lesson of balance is, is really important. And, and I think about what does it mean to be pruned, you know, and sometimes more severely, like if I, you, you have some disease or whatever, mm -hmm. I, I, when I was reflecting on this, you know, in preparation for talking to you, I, I thought, well, what is the time in my life when I feel like I was really more radically pruned than normal? And, and there was a, there was a time, um, a number of years ago when I lost my job and mm -hmm. was out of work for three months. I was, it was a really difficult time, but it ended up being a really wonderful and beautiful time. For one thing, I, I, because I wasn't so busy, I got to spend more time at school with my daughter who was, you know, probably in something like fourth grade, I think. Mm -hmm. And I missed out, I, I would have missed out on some really wonderful experiences that I, I wouldn't have had if I didn't have that time. Mm -hmm. But also it, it led to a real time of reflection on who I was mm -hmm. and professionally and, and ultimately really, I was able to, did find work again, was I was able to define myself and, and my skills so much better and, and ended up in a really wonderful position that was better than what mm -hmm. I had left. And so it's not necessarily, a, it wasn't a process I would have chosen, mm -hmm. but it really did for me bear better fruit in my life. Yeah. When you were talking about that part of the process, I felt like that would be very painful, you know, to get pruned back, especially if the d disease is very deep and all, already in the deep part of the vine, not in the extremities. That's the thought that came to my mind is like, oh, that sounds painful. <laughs> And you're right. Like, yeah, we've all had those moments where that pruning was painful, but maybe we didn't even realize that there was this disease in our extremities that um, was slowly seeping into deeper parts of our lives that we didn't even realize. And God just has this beautiful way of 
bringing fruit out of it all, you know, and like you were saying with your job is kind of like to reorient ourselves to then first say, oh, wait, first, I'm a daughter of God. Okay. And then I'm a wife, then I'm a mother. And then I do this and I do that. I, at least for myself, I get really caught up in all the good things that I could be doing, or at least quote unquote, good things. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a lot of great things out there that we could be doing, but this is re pointing out to me the, the need for essentiality, even in our lives, that we just need one or two good fruits on our vine in order to have those really fruitful grape clusters coming out of us, yeah. not 20. <laughs> those, won't, those won't produce very good grape clusters then. And that, at least for me, that's, that is a constant struggle for me. One other thing, I, I was making a connection that I hadn't made before just yesterday when I was thinking about this connection with the plan of God a presentation in level three. Mm. I thought if, if I thought of myself, there's so many ways you can look at this parable and, and thinking about where you are on the vine. But if I was, let's say I was a bud on the vine uh-huh. and you know, I, I overshadow the other buds, you know, I, I'm not in balance. So I, I'm over vigorous and I don't let the light get to the other buds. I'm, I'm not sure how that would happen, but let's say, or what that really means. But if I, if I don't listen to my my family and friends, or I don't stay in relationship with the people around me, then they suffer. You know, those other buds aren't as fruitful to me. It just is really important to to realize our place in our community. And if we can produce all produce the best possible fruit, then like in the, in the plan of God, we talk, show all these different gifts Mm -hmm. that we have to share with each other Mm -hmm. and how important that is that we all get to express those gifts that God has given, given us Mm -hmm. and, and, and think about what is my fruit? You know, I think about, oh, well, you know, the most important things might be my love for others, my care for others and all the ways we can do that, and my care for the, the world. My vocation might be my fruit. I'm sharing my gifts with others, like on that plan of God. And, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot to think about. Mm-hmm. I think that aspect of the parable is one of my favorites that we lift up, this whole community aspect of the vine, the interdependence aspect of the vine that, you know, if you are overshadowing me, it affects me, or if I'm overshadowing you, or if, if your sap is not flowing through how it affects the rest of the vine kind of a thing. And then I love the way that we lift up well, who all is on the vine, you know, are, are people across the world on the vine or people of other cultures and religions on the vine. And then what about people who have died? Are they on the vine? they saw on the vine. Oh, I love that aspect because, you know, we believe in this communion of saints, you know, we believe in this interdependence spiritually between the living and the dead, and the saints and purgatory and all those things. And I love that interdependent aspect of the, the vine and that imagery. Yes. I think it was in Rebecca's book that I was just reading about um, the cosmic aspect of yes. the vine. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and how it can extend to those people who are not who have um, have died, as well as those that are here right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, reaches across the world and into heaven and across time, and um, it's very profound. That's that yes. is a profound thing to think about is that interconnectedness, and it's also it, for me at least it's relieving because it means that we are not just dependent on ourselves for our own spirituality and salvation. Like we can help each other out and that's a gift in itself as well. We're not, we're not alone. Yes. I just so appreciate how um, the catechesis has helped me see that all of Jesus's parables can be, you know, some of them can be deceptively simple, (laughs) um, but they're not. Right. There's an endless depth there. Yeah. It's almost like the ones that seem the most simple are the most, the most profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. like the mustard seed and the true vine. Yes. And yeah. The pearl. Right, the pearl. You know, like mm-hmm. you, you're you like, oh, this is a simple one. We'll show the three-year-olds. And you're like, oh, <laughs> I need to sit with this one for a little bit longer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Man, well, I don't think that this amount of time that you and I have had is nearly enough to scratch the surface of this parable. Like, I think there's a reason why... The children have revealed to us that this parable is so important to to them and that linchpin for all of level two and level three. 
So there's no way that one episode of the podcast can can scratch the surface of this parable. But I'm grateful for you to share your experience on the vine of working with vines with us to help us to kind of ponder this parable maybe in a different light than we've ever experienced before. Like I've I've never been on a vineyard. Like I've never I've seen pictures and it seems really cool. I'd love to California and see see your vineyards. That would be really neat. Yeah. But I appreciate your willingness to share that experience with us so that we can ponder this parable deeper. Yeah, you're welcome. This is really um, meaningful for me as well. Thank you all so much for joining us for this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and Child podcast. If you would like to dive into the true vine parable a little bit more, I would highly suggest that you read chapter four of our book, Ways to Nurture the Relationship with God, where Sophia Calvaletti and Patricia Culture they dive into this parable into a historical context, a biblical context, a context with through the eyes of a catechesis of the Good Shepherd, and allows you to dive even deeper into the cosmic meaning of this parable. Of course, I will have a link to this book for you in the show notes if you do not yet own this book. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all the contributing members for making this podcast possible. Thank you so much. If you would like to learn more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for joining us this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.